Well, I think we're about to begin. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for our first State of the Lakes in person for the last three years. As a lot of you are aware, since that time, we've accomplished quite a bit. Um, and even in the last year, since we had our last virtual presentation, we have made a lot of progress. Um, I see so many familiar faces tonight, as well as a few new ones, a lot of community partners, our university partners, WCMC volunteers, um, some employees from the Worcester Department of Public Works. As many of you know, the Lakes and Ponds program began at DPW, and I'm really excited to um, have them here tonight, as well as some folks from the Department of Sustainability and Resilience. We have some city councilors here this evening, so thank you for your continued support of the program. Um, and before we jump in, I think um, I would like to give the floor to our mayor, Mayor Petty, um, to say a few words. Thank you, Jackie, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm glad to be here with Ken. You represent yourself with Jimmy O'Day. Joe and Jacob Bergeron from Jimmy O'Day's office with us, a Sue Mailman from the school committee. Of course, George Russell in the back, his district, district council right here. George, and of course, the manager's here. I just want to say, uh, probably back before Jackie was working for us, I came up with this idea about blue space. I put it out there and just took off. And we funded it, and uh, we, that's where Jackie came from. Now we have Nick, we have Emily in the back from the intern. So give them a hand for everything they do. And then, I did meet uh, Jackie's mom tonight, right over here. The family's over here. Welcome to Worcester from Connecticut. That's your dad, too. Okay. And uh, your whole family came up for your presentation. And uh, so you owe him a dinner tonight afterwards, I take it. But uh, this is important to us. Our lakes are important. We have, is it 17 or 18, Jackie? Over 20 lakes here and that we uh, work on and do a really good job. And what's good about Jackie and Nick and I guess now Emily too, is that they get the community involved in the lakes program here in the city and they get their input, go back and do the testing, tell them what they have to do, the watershed associations throughout the city. So I just want to thank everything you're doing. You're Kutzingman Lake, of course, we had the incident last, was it last year? It was last year and, uh, and you handled that pretty good. I give you an A plus and you and your team for doing that. So, and how you handled it very professionally and, uh, and working with the DPW. And John, now you report to John Adele. I just want to thank John for his input and what he does in the environment, the work here. So keep up the great work and look forward to your presentation tonight. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're also graced tonight by our um, city manager, city manager Eric Batista. Um, I know that you would like to say a few words as well. So thank you so much. Come on up. Thank you, Jackie. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here and, and welcome to the annual State of the Lakes. I love it. I love the name. Um, you know, I just want to thank Jackie for her leadership and her incredible, uh, amazing uh, work and expertise around this. So I, I want to thank you on behalf of the administration. You know, she stepped up, she stepped up in taking the Lakes and Ponds program to the next level, something that uh, the major just alluded to, growing the team and engaging with residents and expanding uh, its impact. I also want to recognize our Chief Sustainability Officer, John O'Dell, uh, for his support, and he's back there uh, of, as the head of the Department of Sustainability and Resiliency. And as uh, uh, Jackie mentioned earlier, some of you may know, we recently moved the Lakes and Ponds program from DPW to uh, the Sustainability Office because we wanted to make sure that um, the department was part of the Green Worcester Plan, and that Green Worcester Plan was something here to stay and something that we strongly support as an administration. And, and you know, it reflects our commitment to maintaining our valued blue spaces in a sustainable way, ensuring that their quality and accessibility for recreational use and promotion of economic development for generations to come. The Lakes and Ponds program is also a great example of a collective effort between city and its residents. In fact, the program itself was created in response to resident concern from our, for our blue spaces. So because of all of you is why this program exists. And I just want to say that my administration is committed to continuing to invest in the program so that it can keep working closely with the community to monitor and manage our bodies of water as well as engage the community to care about these vital resources. 
You know, one example of its community partnership is the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. Big name for a big uh, contribution of what they do. So I thank you for your collaboration and your, uh, and your partnership, which has trained over 50 community scientists to monitor our blue spaces and make sure the water is safe for all residents and visitors, as well as for their pets. Um, this past year, we saw the construction of the alum dozing station, and that was pretty cool. We should have more of those, which is a huge step forward for Indian Lake and cyanobacteria management. And tonight, Jackie will tell you a little bit more about these and other recent monitoring uh, and management efforts throughout the city. you also hear about how other organizations are getting involved and how you as residents can continue uh, to, uh, to get involved through either partnerships or by becoming a community uh, sci uh, scientist. This is a great way to help create a more vibrant community for all of us. So before I turn this back over on behalf of the city, I'd like to thank all of our university collaborators, which are State, WPI, and Clark. Thank you, and I'd also like to thank the Indian Lake, Technic Brook, and Lake Quinsig Watershed Association for their hard work and strong partnership in, protect in protecting our blue space. And last but not least, uh, at least a big thank you to our volunteers, WCMA, um, uh, WCMC. Um, you know, a lot of the work that Jackie does in her, in her department uh, do cannot be possible without those volunteers and the support from all of you. Uh, so thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Manager, and, and for everyone coming out tonight. Um, so, as you may have gathered, my name is Jacqueline, Jacqueline Bermheister. I'm the coordinator of the Lakes and Ponds program with the City of Worcester Department of Sustainability and uh, Resilience. I'm joined here tonight by my colleagues from the department, Nick Pagan and Emily Menard, who is our uh, most recent addition, our new intern. Um, though she has been working through the WCMC for some time now. Um, so just right before we begin, I uh, just want to invite you all to grab some food at any point. Um, if you need to get up, stretch, go out and use the bathrooms at any point, please feel free. We'll have multiple points throughout the uh, presentation to ask questions. Um, if you have any, this presentation is also being recorded and live streamed. Um, so you will have an opportunity to watch it again. Um, if you sign in on the sheet on your table, um, I will send it to your inbox directly. You also have a chance there to sign up for our brand new newsletter, the Blue Space Splash, if you check the box. Um, so yeah, so let's jump right in. <clears throat> so usually around this time of year, um, while we're getting ready for the annual State of the Lakes program, we're also planning another event, a collaboration with Mass Wildlife. It is a really popular program, our ice fishing and safety program. Ice fishing is a really great way to get residents exposed to their blue spaces during a time when you're not necessarily thinking about lakes and ponds. Getting a new uh, hobby and really learning to love your lakes is how we believe in the Lakes and Ponds program that people begin to appreciate and take care of these resources. I don't know if any of you passed any lakes on the way here tonight, but there is not much ice to be had. And I realized today when I saw the forecast that we actually didn't even have a snow date for this event. And you know what, we didn't actually need it. So while we're in 2023, um, this is a trend that we've been seeing back through 2022 when we're talking about the state of the lakes. This um, is the temperature, the temperature range every day between June and August of 2022 taken from the Worcester Regional Airport. Each of those blue bars is the high and low temperature for that day. When those blue bars sit in that yellow portion of the graph, those are the average temperatures going back quite a few years. Everything above that, those are higher than average temperatures. As you can see, we spent a lot of time in 2022 up in these higher temperature ranges. On many days, we actually hit high temperatures for record high temperatures. You can see the two heat advisories that were declared in mid-July and early August up in this map or in this graph. 
So while this was going on, much of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was experiencing drought conditions. And so while Worcester was feeling the heat much like the rest of the state, Worcester was feeling it in a very unique way. Worcester is the second largest city in New England. And what comes with being the second large city? A lot of infrastructure, a lot of roads and roofs. You in the water quality community know these as impervious surfaces, areas that do not absorb water and create storm water conditions. The other thing about roads and roofs is that they absorb heat. When you map the roads and roofs in Worcester, you find that we have them obviously everywhere, but especially concentrated in the heart of our city. In contrast to roads and roofs, we have trees and grass. In addition to providing shade um, these, and absorbing water, these elements of a city create a cooling effect. When we mapped those here in the city of Worcester, we found that most of our trees and most of our grass are on the outskirts of the city, and in general, we have less than the surrounding communities. While roofs and roads and trees and grass are not mutually exclusive, in fact, the Department of Sustainability right now is working on integrating these things more, what it means for us right now in Worcester is that and on any given day, we feel the heat more than in other places, especially in the urban core of our city. During, the, during these periods of heat waves that I was talking about earlier, um, we had to open cooling centers, especially for these vulnerable populations that were living in not just the highest density of roads, but the highest density of people in our city. But this is not the only reason that Worcester is unique. Worcester has over 20 lakes and ponds scattered throughout the entire city. These, not, these lakes are both natural and man-made, and they have public access in the form of beaches and boat ramps and trails, and um, a lot of them you can get to on a public bus. These lakes are a place where you can cool off to recreate. You can go swimming, you can go fishing, you can go boating, almost any recreational activity that you could think of doing on a pond, you can do here in Worcester, which is pretty cool. But lakes do more than just provide recreational activities. They provide what are called ecosystem services, which include all the direct and indirect benefits that healthy uh, environments provide. For example, we mentioned it's usually a little bit cooler around lakes and ponds. That's because of a body of water's ability to heat up and cool down slower than the surrounding air. And so when you have a lake or pond in a city, it creates a cooling effect on hot days. This is known as a supporting and regulating service. Other examples of supporting and regulating services are flood, uh, excuse me, flood protection, carbon sequestration, and nutrient cycling. Another ecosystem service that lakes provide are wildlife habitat. And this is more than just for the frogs and the fish and the macroinvertebrates that live in our lakes and ponds. It's also that adjacent wildlife and biodiversity that is present because the lake exists. There are not too many cities out there that boast bald eagles. But if you go to Coe's Reservoir or Lake Quinsigamond, and I invite you to go to Lake Quinsigamond Watershed Association Facebook page, you will see a lot of bald eagles. And the only reason that they are able to live here next to Worcester is because they have the lake to be able to fish in. And that's the only place where they are going to get enough food to support um, their reproduction. In addition to wildlife habitat, and as any biologist would tell you, the more wildlife you have, the more biodiversity you have, the more resiliency you have, we have um, lakes provide what are called existence services. These are the services that you get simply by looking out your window, seeing a lake, and having your property value go up. Like these. Lakes will inspire people, they'll inspire people to do art, they'll provide a location for you to bring students to have hands-on natural STEM learning outside nature's classroom. Um, these are opportunities that Worcester has times 
20. But unfortunately, due to all the factors that we mentioned above, the heat, the impervious surface, the high density people, the city itself, these water bodies are threatened. The services they provide are threatened. Roads and roofs, they don't allow for the absorption of rain by the soil. They create runoff. And what we have to do to prevent flooding is create a stormwater system to channel that water to our lakes and ponds. It's a feat of engineering, but it means that we bypass the absorption process. All the sediment that was in the road goes into these catch basins, and then they end up in our water bodies. And so sediment in the water bodies is a challenge because not only does it cloud the water bodies, it makes it heat up faster, it shallows the water bodies, it's not great for the gills of fish or their egg masses, but those sediments could also contain bacteria from doggy bags that have been thrown into the catch basin or from geese that have been hanging out on the beach. When that bacteria, after a rain event, gets into our lakes and ponds, it causes the bacteria in the water to go up, and when we test it, we find it's not healthy or suitable for our people to be swimming with, we have to close the beach. On a really hot day in summer, that's no fun for anyone. Another thing that these sediments and the stormwater can bring into our lakes and ponds are nutrients. Nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen that are great for our lawns, make them nice and green, but do a similar thing in our lakes. They feed algae, cyanobacteria, and help them to reproduce at a rapid rate to cause blooms are those green scums that you sometimes see on the water. In addition to being icky, these things have the potential to create toxins that are harmful to humans and pets. And when we see these things occurring at our lakes and ponds, we sometimes have to close the lakes. And when this is happening in the summertime, again, a real bummer for recreational activity. But when these things also die off, they create anoxic conditions that cause fish kills as well. So that's not great for our lake aquatic ecosystem either. Nutrients will also feed invasive aquatic plants, which can be brought into lakes from outside sources, such as trailers or boats that are visiting our lakes. When you have a high number of people using lakes, there's a higher chance that you'll bring in unwanted hitchhikers. So invasive plants are a problem because they will outcompete all the native species that provide homes for our native aquatic life. And so when you have them being crowded out, you not only have conditions in a lake that are not suitable for recreation, but you will also have a monoculture of one type of plant that really is not allowing other um, biodiversity to occur. Finally, Worcester was, is a post-industrial city. During the 1800s, we had a lot of mills that were using the power generated from our ponds to create all sorts of goods that make Worcester, uh, well, that made Worcester the city that it is today. Um, during that time, there were not that many regulations um, as far as pollution controls, and we are still worried about the effects of those legacy contaminants, as well as emerging contaminants, such as PFAS or heavy metals that could be a threat to our water bodies today. And lastly, when you live in a city, you have a lot of people, and therefore you have a higher chance that you're going to run into challenges with litter. Litter is a problem in our waterways because our, our um, wildlife can mistake it for food. It could also be dangerous to beachgoers and lake users. So many of these threats become intensified when it gets warmer out. You have more people, you have more stormwater, you have um, a lot more of those conditions that make it easy for cyanobacteria to grow. But unfortunately, when it gets warmer, that's when we rely on these resources the most. The city of Worcester recognized this, and in 2016, with the support of the community, they created the Lakes and Ponds Program, which is actually the very first municipal lakes and ponds management program in the New England area. The vision of the program is a Worcester where all of our waterways are healthy, safe for their designated uses, and accessible to all residents. And the mission of the program is to proactively manage these waterways for the threats that I mentioned above and preserve those ecosystem services. We do this with a three-pronged approach. 
At the very core of it is monitoring, which is collecting high quality data that can be used for efficient and effective decision making. We use this data to create and implement management plans to prevent, intercept, and mitigate pollution threats in our waterways. And finally, we use outreach and education to engage the community around our blue spaces because at the end of the day, this program could not do everything on its own and we really need to co collaborate between government entities and with the community itself. And throughout this, this presentation, that will become abundantly clear. So tonight, we're very pleased to be here with you to share with you the biggest outreach event that we have of the year, the State of the Lakes, in which we share the progress that we've made on this mission over the past year. Tonight, you're gonna to be hearing about how we're monitoring these different threats and all the exciting partnerships that we have working with us, how we, all the technology um, and the techniques that we've implemented to improve our waterways from the local to the watershed level, as well as review some of the ways that we've connected with you. And we really do think that this is the heart of the program. And of course, we'll talk about the state of our lakes, how it all panned out for the health of our water bodies and what the future directions are for the Lakes and Ponds program. So the monitoring portion of our program is perhaps the most important, understanding how our lakes are doing and how our actions are changing them. In order to monitor as many lakes as possible, we have a variety of different techniques, all that have benefits and drawbacks. We have in-house lake monitoring, contracted lake monitoring, remote monitoring, community partnerships, as well as community science approaches. Our in-house monitoring is what we call the bread and butter of our monitoring program. This is Nick. He is our in-house biologist. <laughs> he goes out twice a month and uses um, a DEP, a Department of Environmental Protection approved sampling plan to go out and compare how our waterways are doing in real time for those variety of parameters that we choose to measure the threats that I mentioned above. We measure the nutrients, we measure the temperature, we measure the oxygen, the bacteria, industrial contaminants in the water. We do this at four major water bodies, Indian Lake, Coes Reservoir, Lake Quinsigamon, and Bell Pond. And the benefit of this is that we learn these lakes really, really well. We see what's going on there from a day-to-day -day basis, and we could react quickly when there are challenges. The drawback, of course, is that it takes a lot of time. And sometimes in lake management, you have emergencies and you need to respond. In those cases, we'll sometimes bring in contracted services. Um, for example, um, we'll sometimes bring in local specialist contractors that know our Worcester lakes to help us when we think there might be a problem with cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria samples require special handling. They need to be collected, prepared a special way, and then shipped across the, the country for enumeration overnight. So that's something that we get help with doing just because it is a whole process. We also have them do toxin analysis and our aquatic plant surveys. Aquatic plant surveys require a special skill set. They require a lot of time, but they're so important for our management plans of the lake. We do this at all the water bodies that we do our in-house monitoring at, but the benefit is that we could fit in on scheduled samples and we could use those special skill sets. The drawback, it's expensive. <laughs> we just can't do it for everything. Um, and the results can be slower than we want them to be. And so there, there are those drawbacks to contracted mo monitoring. So continuous remote monitoring has the opportunity to collect data even when our contractors and we can't get there. So these are continuous monitoring buoys. These are solar powered monitoring devices that we've deployed in several of our lakes and ponds to take readings every half an hour for a variety of different parameters related to cyanobacteria activity. We measure things like temperature, turbidity, chlorophyll, phycocyanin. We've deployed these two at Indian Lake and, sorry, one at Indian Lake and two at Lake Quinsigamon. These are really promising devices. 
We have a lot of data from them. Um, we have 24-7 monitoring. Unfortunately, they're just not as reliable as we would like them to be. The technology is getting there. We're working with the manufacturer to improve the design. But there are some times when we start getting these crazy numbers. Um, we're getting alerts that something is wrong. We go out there, we find a giant wave has toppled over one, and it's been taking measurements of the open air. So, you know, it's um, one of those things that we're working on, but it's no replace for in-house monitoring. Partnerships are another way that we can collect data about our lakes while leveraging the strengths and needs of other organizations. A great example of this is our partnership with the Indian Lake Water, I'm sorry, the Lake Quinsigamon Watershed Association. I'm looking right at you. <laughs> the Lake Quinsigamon Watershed Association. So a few years ago, um, we were approached by uh, Lake Quinsigamon. They were looking to get more data on the tributaries or the, lake, the streams that are going into Lake Quinsigamon. They were specifically concerned about bacteria beyond what we were doing in the open lake. So we worked with them to develop a sampling plan that was approved by the state, train them into how to collect samples, and help pay for some of the samplings. They went out found some interns, trained the interns, and for the last four years, they've been going out and collecting 10 samples once to twice a month in various places around the lake. Not only does this provide high quality data, but it gives a young person the opportunity to go out and learn these techniques and be introduced to environmental science. If you're interested in seeing the data that the Lake Quinsigamon Watershed Association has, um, has come up with, you can see their report. It's now available at lqwa.org. Another partnership that we're really, really excited about this year is the one that we have with Worcester State University. So this is a collaboration um, with their newly formed Central Massachusetts Watershed Project. Worcester State obtained a grant for students to sample two lakes. And they did this in the Tatnick Brook watershed, which is on the western portion of the city. We sample at the very bottom at Tatnick Brook in Coe's Reservoir. But through this partnership, we were able to train some students from the university to do, use the same techniques we use at Coe's to two other water bodies further up the watershed, Patch Reservoir and Cook's Pond. On the very same day that we went out to sample Coe's, they went out, they sampled these two lakes, and they sampled it for the same parameters. Now we can compare these lakes apples to apples on any given day over the course of the summer in what is known as a watershed gradient. And we'll talk more, or an urbanization gradient, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. I should also credit um, Clark University. Um, with this partnership, they were doing some tangential um, monitoring as well and really did support this collaboration by um, sharing some of their equipment with us. One of the things we're most proud of here at the Lakes and Ponds program is the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative, which you've already heard of a few times tonight. And so going forward, I'm just going to say WCMC because, let's face it, it's a mouthful. Um, the WCMC has come a long way since 2017 when it began. We've gotten to the point where we could actually use the data that we're collecting with our community scientists to start making assessments about our lakes and even be included in our State of the Lake presentations. In short, the WCMC is a group of community scientists, and that's regular people, Read regular people who get training by the city to collect water quality samples twice monthly for cyanobacteria, which is becoming an increasing concern in water bodies across the city. The idea is that we wanted to find a cheaper alternative from those samples that were taken by our contractors and shipped across the country. We wanted to make it cheap, we wanted to make it accessible, we, wanted, we felt like people wanted to get these results quickly and cheaply so that they could make <coughs> Um, decisions about how to use their water bodies. And so what these community scientists do is they take a variety of different water samples, they look at a different, few different parameters related to cyanobacteria, and we've developed a methodology where we can begin to rank the exposure risk to cyanotoxins. Every month we would publish a report 
in which we talk about the risk at each of the water bodies that was in the WCNC. Some of your tables have examples of these reports. We used colors to denote the risk. And in, we got these reports out within two to three days of our sampling on our website. And to make sure that the people using the water bodies got this information, we installed signs with QR codes at our water bodies so that when you go to the beach, if you want to know what the risk is for exposure to cyanotoxins, you can scan the sign and be taken straight to the latest report. To date, we have had 28 lakes in and around Worcester, part of the Worcester WCMC. And this past year, we've had, I think, 18 just in Worcester alone. So we are really excited about how much this, pro this program has grown and are especially thankful for the volunteers who keep coming back year after year. But you don't need to be a scientist to be in the WCMC, and you don't need to be in the WCMC to be a community scientist. It could be as easy as sending a text message. This is our Bell Pond staff gauge. It was installed um, with DPW a few years ago at Bell Pond, right below Belmont Street. This staff gauge um, makes Bell Pond part of a global water storage, freshwater storage study. And of course, we are all very aware of the importance that freshwater plays. You can help contribute to not just our local understanding of lake height, but this global study by just texting in the level of the lake to the number that is on this gauge. And it's that easy. So overall, this year has been um, a year of great accomplishments for monitoring out in the city of Worcester. We have monitored not just our four state of the lake state lakes, but six with the help of Worcester State. We have 18 data sets for local lakes, uh, excuse me, we have WCMC data for 18 local lakes here in Worcester. We've collected PFAS and other contaminants like VOCs and heavy metals at four of our lakes. We've had 15 depth readings at the Bell Pond staff gauge submitted. We have three remote monitoring data sets from our uh, floating solar powered buoys. We have four plant maps that were contracted to help us determine how to move forward with our, um, with our management for invasive aquatic plants. We have two cyanobacteria density data sets. And probably most exciting, we were able to submit two years worth of our data to the Department of Environmental Protection for assessment of our lakes at a state level. So we have a lot to be proud of. Lake management is how we respond to those various threats using data. Historically, when it comes to our lakes, we focused on maintaining those recreational values, those recreational services. But we recognize that a healthy ecosystem also offers other ecosystem services. Um, we use short, medium, and long-term solutions in order to um, improve our water bodies. And all of them are driven by our monitoring program. Obviously, the goal is always to prevent pollution from getting into our blue spaces to begin with. But if you think of the stormwater system as the conduit for pollution to get to our water bodies, and it's not the only way, um, preventing pollution from being created is a really difficult task and is expensive, takes time to implement, and usually involves a cultural change. In the meantime, we could do pollution interception. Um, we can intercept pollution before it gets to our waterways and remediate it. And finally, especially when there's a public health concern, we'll use in-lake management to keep our lakes open to recreation and delay some of the worst ecosystem degradation consequences. A really simple example of pollution prevention um, is our goose fencing. So goose fencing is a fairly uh, simple <laughs> uh, response to a problem that we were seeing at a lot of our beaches. 
Um, so a lot of the beach closures that we experience in the city are actually driven by goose feces. So goose, geese will come up onto the beach from the water at night after everyone leaves the beaches. They'll kind of party a little bit. And then they will leave the beach filthy. If it rains, all of this can run back into the water and cause a bacteria exceedance. As the goose population in Worcester grows, this is becoming a larger and larger problem. So how do we deal with this? As it turns out, we can use what we, this homemade goose fencing. It's um, basically will be, it's put in between the water body and the beach and the geese don't like going over it. I don't know if they're too lazy. Must, some people think it has to do with the fact that they don't like being, having something in between them and predators when they're on the beach so that they could fly away. But in essence, if we put this up, when the lifeguards put this up at the end of the day, and it stays up, it's not taken down by anyone, the geese won't come up and the beaches are clean. Lifeguards are happy, they don't have to clean it up. And the lake stays open because there's no pollution. So we've, in, we've used this solution um, for the last two years now. We continue to try to refine the design of the goose fence. We want it to be easy to install, we want it to be durable, but we also want people to be able to use the lake. Um, and we've been using this to some extent at Indian Lake, Coes Reservoir, and Bell Pond. Rain barrels are another small way that urban homeowners can help to prevent stormwater from entering our lakes by collecting it before it even leaves their property. In addition to stopping stormwater, you can use this water for your garden and save money on your water bill. So we do this by offering an annual bulk distribution uh, rain barrel event. You can go online right now and order a rain barrel um, that will come in bulk in June at an event that we hold, um, and you will get the bulk discount price. We can only prevent so much stormwater from reaching our uh, stormwater system, but once there, there are still opportunities to prevent the pollution from reaching our lakes. We do this by creating opportunities for stormwater to filter into the soil again. Um, so we'll use biofiltration stations, sometimes known as rain gardens. These plants and sediments will help filter out pollutants and also cool the water before it reaches the lake. So these gardens will provide, um, generally require certain specifications to build. They need to be on public land. We need a certain amount of space. They need to be near the stormwater system. They need to be the right grade. But we still have managed to install two of them in the last few years, one at Indian Lake and one at Lake Quinsigamond. And this is in addition to all of the other work um, on installing these that the sewer operations division um, has accomplished as well. So with rain barrels, you could stop water from entering the stormwater system. And with rain gardens, you could prevent it from reaching the lake and filtering it. But what happens if you already have an entire stream of stormwater? Such is the case with Arrowhead Brook. <laughs> so this is the major tributary to Indian Lake. Up to 75% of the water in Indian Lake comes through Ararat Brook. So here is Indian Lake, the northern portion, and this is Ararat Brook. And you can see it's a gigantic watershed. This water is coming from Holden a lot of the time. We've done studies to track stormwater here, looking for those pollutants, phosphorus and, and sediments up this watershed. And unfortunately, there is not one major source. If we wanted to fix this problem using rain gardens, it would be a lot of money a lot of time, plus we'd have to get Holden on board. So what can we do? Um, the alum dosing station is a potential fix. So the alum dosing station uses aluminum polychloride, or um, what some people know as aluminum sulfate, to treat the stormwater that's in Air Route Brook. So this is a safe chemical that's used in drinking water filtration. And when added to a lake, we found that it filters out particles and sediments and phosphorus so that it's no longer able to be used by those microorganisms that are causing the cyanobacteria blooms that plague Indian Lake and other places in Worcester. 
We've applied PAC and alum to Indian Lake with great results. Unfortunately, because of the rain that's bringing more stormwater in through uh, Ararat Brook, the effects are short lasting. By adding the aluminum polychloride directly to Ararat Brook, we have the potential to treat the pollution as it comes in. So the way I'm talking about this makes it seem like we haven't used this yet. That's because we haven't. This has been a long-term project by the Lakes and Ponds program, but we are so excited that this spring we finally had it constructed and we are going to be testing this solution out over the next few months. This is a pretty novel idea. Um, there's only one right now in Massachusetts. It's had really great luck over in Wellesley, increasing the clarity of water, decreasing the number of closures. And so we are really, really excited to see how we can implement this solution here at Indian Lake. Yeah, I'm very excited. This is a, this is a big project. <laughs> so thank, uh, thank you for everyone's patience on it. <laughs> Um, so we've talked a lot about stormwater uh, pollutants, but there is another threat to our lakes in the form of invasive aquatic plants. So this is Salisbury Pond, <laughs> um, taken from the spillway. This here, down the bottom, this is all water chestnut. So many of you are familiar with this one. It's a really aggressive invasive that grows on the top of the water and pretty much could take a blue surface and turn it wall to wall green. It has a really unique life history in which it will drop a seed into the sediment and that seed could live for up to 10 years. So it's always a long-term management plan and it's always a lot of money. The best way to cure invasive aquatic plants is to not let them get in your water body in the first place. And so this year, uh, we've installed two boat decontamination stations. So these are solar powered they're free to use, self-serve systems where someone bringing a boat into Indian Lake or Coes Reservoir could use vacuums, blowers, scrubbers to remove any invasive aquatic plants that might be hanging on to their boat or their trailer, reducing the chance that they're going to bring in another invasive that's going to cause us more problems in the future. It's also an opportunity to share some resources. There's QR codes so people could learn how to do it. We made a Blue Space Minute on how to do it. Um, it's really an opportunity for uh, boater education and um, invasive education. And so we've installed these at Indian Lake and Coes Reservoir in September. Um, we're looking forward to seeing how they perform over the course of an entire summer. Unfortunately, um, many of um, the aquatic plants, um, sorry, unfortunately, Many invasive aquatic plants have already arrived at our lakes and ponds, um, having been introduced before the boat stations were installed. So we use, um, we contract the application of herbicides to deal with these. Oh, and if, if you didn't know that, this is what, this is the up close to the water chestnut. It's pretty aggressive. Um, so we will use um, contracted um, herbicide applications um, and this doesn't mean that we're going into a lake and willy-nilly just applying chemicals. We use those maps that we had our contractors create where they're mapping all the different invasives and we choose herbicides specifically for the invasive aquatic plants that we find in the water body. And by doing so, we're really trying to allow the native plants to survive and thrive. All of our treatments are specific and they're all um, permitted by the Conservation Commission and the Department of Environment, in, Environmental Protection. This year, we performed invasive plant treatments at Indian Lake, Coes Reservoir, Patch Reservoir, Lake Quinsigamond, Little Indian Lake, and Salisbury Pond, either through the Lakes and Ponds program or in collaboration with other organizations in the city. And much like with our invasive plants, we are unfortunately in a position where our water bodies are already dealing with conditions that make them more susceptible to cyanobacteria blooms and the public health and ecological challenges that come with them. So while we work longer to, on longer term sustainable solutions like rain gardens and alum dosing stations and rain barrels to stop these pollutants from getting into our lakes, we use cyanobacteria treatments to keep the populations of harmful cyanobacteria blooms down. These are applied from a boat. Um, we use 
um, data collected from our monitoring program to determine when is the best time to do it to keep our lakes and ponds open. Um, and again, they're all permitted by the Conservation Commission. And so we've done these treatments at Indian Lake, Coes Reservoir, Patch Reservoir, Elm Park Pond, University Park Pond, and the Vietnam Memorial Pond. So what are our management accomplishments in 2022? We treated six lakes for cyanobacteria, seven lakes for invasive aquatic plants. We built three goose fences and installed them at beaches. We built or installed two boat decontamination stations. We distributed 80 rain barrels to the community and we built one alum dosing station. <laughs> But despite this, there's still so much to do, and we would not have been able to accomplish all that we have without the support of the community. And so we need you. We are reaching out to you as lake uh, residents, as uh, university partners, to help us um, identify what's going on in the city. We were a staff, of, we're a full-time staff of two. We now have Emily, but we can't possibly be everywhere at once. Additionally, when it comes to public health and accessibility, we want to make sure that you, the public, are getting the information that you need in order to make informed decisions about interacting with your water bodies. And so how do we do outreach and education? Three ways. We meet with the community, we hold events and programs, and we provide e uh, resources and alerts. So we know that there are a lot of community groups out there that share our mission in some way. There's so many ways to care about a blue space. We know that most groups have some connection to that. So we go, we wanna to listen to community needs. We share the data that we have and the management updates at Water Bodies. And we try to collaborate on projects where you have overlapping interests in order to reduce redundancies. A lot of these organizations are watershed organizations because of the high overlap in that mission. But we meet with other community groups and nonprofits as well. We meet with universities, we've met with high school classes, and yes, even city council. We have events and programs. Um, these, the goals of these are, um, excuse me. <laughs> in addition to meeting people where they are, we also invite people to meet with us. Um, we host a number of different events and clinics throughout the year to invite people to use our blue spaces with the hopes that if they use them, they will love them, and if they love them, they will protect them. And we want to teach them how to do just that. Um, over the past few years, we've offered ice fishing and ice safety. We've had a lot of angler events with mass wildlife. We have our WCMC training and community science activities. We have the state of the lakes. We, in addition, we have stormwater education courses, invasive plant identification, all sorts of programs to engage with you. And finally, we want to make sure that people have the information that they need to make informed choices about how they interact with their waterways. We want to be a trustworthy and accessible source of information. All of the data that we collect as a program is publicly available, but we want to go the next step to make it accessible to you as someone who maybe is not a scientist. That's why we do things like creating the Blue Space Minute, which is a short educational video series on the YouTube channel of the city of Worcester in which we talk about various um, lake topics. I would like to give a huge shout out to our cable services department who's here with us tonight and has worked so hard at creating these Blue Space uh, Minute episodes. They've done an excellent job and I think really do help communicate those issues to the public. Uh, they make us look good. So we also have our State of the Lake reports, annual reports, on um, all of the different water bodies that we sample. You can find some on your table tonight, as well as codes to the most recent reports that are currently available on our website. Um, we have the WCMC reports that are available on the WCMC website. There's also examples of those on your table tonight. Um, we have special reports um, that we that come up throughout the year as needed. For example, we had the Lake um, Ave pump station event that we responded to last year and created a, a report on that that can be found on our webpage, as well as we put out PSAs and posters at our water bodies whenever there are lake closures for cyanobacteria blooms or, or if there's a, a lake treatment that's occurring. 
So all of these offerings, most of them at least, can be found through the Lakes and Ponds program webpage at worcestermagovernor slash blue space. So our accomplishments in 2022, we attended over 30 community meetings, meeting with you all out there. We trained over 50 WCMC volunteers. We published 12 WCMC cyanotoxin exposure reports, six state of the lake reports in collaboration with Worcester State University. We had three angler events. We released three episodes of the Blue Space Minute and we had two public presentations, two live public presentations, um, which is awesome. So now that you've had an overview of how we collect our data and how we're protecting our waterways, we come to the part that we've all been waiting for, the lake assessments. These are the results from our monitoring program after the public outreach, after the, um, the management has gone into place. When we first began monitoring our waterways as part of this program in 2017, we focused our limited time and resources on just four lakes, Indian Lake, Coes Reservoir, Bell Pond, and Lake Quinsigamans. But the truth is, all of our waterways are important because all of them are connected. As the program grew over time, we began to add additional monitoring programs like the WCMC, and, and to date, we've collected data not just from four lakes in Worcester, but from over 17 lakes over four watersheds. And they're all helping us get a clearer picture of how the city is doing with its lake. We're also now able to make two kinds of assessments. You're all familiar with the state of the lake assessment, the rating of excellent, good, fair, or poor that we give to our water buddies every year as a culmination of the parameters that we've examined in our monitoring throughout the season. These ratings require a lot of data and really high quality data. So we need a sampling plan that's approved by the Department of Environmental Protection. We need to go there multiple times, test it for multiple things to really get a clear understanding of what's going on. This year, six lakes in our program meet those requirements and we are able to give a state of the lake, not to four lakes, but to six. But that doesn't mean the monitoring that we do elsewhere isn't important. We're still able to use that data. 11 lakes in our program now have initial assessments and recommendations based on that limited data um, to allow us to focus our future monitoring and management decisions. There's a lot of data, <laughs> if you haven't realized yet. Um, and, and because of all that, we are not going to be able to get into everything tonight. I know, you're all very disappointed that we're not gonna be doing every single lake. Um, but if you are interested in getting more information on a particular lake, or learning more about a particular parameter, those are all available on the um, City of Worcester website. You can scan all of the codes that are available on your table to get to those individual reports. You could also check out the WCMC webpage um, where we have our cyanobacteria data. This year, instead of just talking about individual water bodies, we're gonna be grouping our lakes by watersheds. Watersheds um, is a word that I've used several times tonight, but warrants a quick definition. It's a geographic area defined by the basin that water flows into. If it rains on the western side of Worcester, there's a good chance that water is flowing into Tatnick Brook. And if it rains on the eastern side of Worcester, there's a good chance that that rain is going into Lake Quinsigamond. And when you group water bodies by where the rain falls, you can start making really good um, observations about how all those waterways are connected and what is happening to water quality as it moves through. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about four watersheds, Millbrook, Lake Quinsigamond, Tatnick Brook, and Park Ponds. So we're gonna jump right in to Millbrook. So Millbrook Watershed is defined by Indian Lake. This is one that you um, could probably pick out on a map. So, oh, for, I should say Millbrook is right in the center of the city um, and, and is definitely defined by Indian Lake, the largest waterway in the Millbrook Watershed. 
We've been studying Indian Lake for some time now. What we haven't been studying for some time is Salisbury Pond, which is a little bit further away and connected to Indian Lake by an underground culvert from Indian Lake Spillway. We also have to the south of Indian Lake, Little Indian Lake, which is connected under Grove Street. And we have Kiver Pond to the west. So Indian Lake is the largest water body completely inside the city. It has two public beaches and a public boat ramp, and so offers a lot of recreational potential to our residents. It's been sampled by the Lakes and Ponds program and the WCMC since 2017 and has an ongoing Lakes and Pond management plan. Some of the things we're concerned about at Indian Lake are cyanobacteria blooms. We've had some there that have closed the lake for an entire summer previous to the Lakes and Ponds program that has led to poor water quality, nuisive and in, nu invasive and nuisance aquatic plants such as Eurasian milfoil, as well as beach closures due to fecal bacteria exceedances at the Clayson Beach and the Shore Park Beach. So in order to address some of these concerns, the Lakes and Ponds program has done cyanobacteria treatments, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the presentation. We've also installed goose fencing. Um, this year, we've also um, continued our invasive plant management prevention. Historically, Indian Lakes Eurasian milfoil was managed by a drawdown. Um, more recently, we have um, shifted to an herbicide approach, which we found to be a lot more efficient and has eliminated the need for the drawdown, which is great. We no longer have to worry about Eurasian milfoil in the short term. In order to protect that investment, we were able to install these, um, these um, boat decontamination stations in Morgan Park where the boat launch is. So how did we do in 2023? Well, our invasive plant mapping that we did at the end of the summer showed that there was no Eurasian milfoil. So that was a huge success. It was something we were struggling with for a long time. Um, we actually had about eight native plants found in Indian Lake. So that's a great sign. It means that we have an e uh, a, a bounding back ecosystem of native plants. We did find one invasive plant, the common reed, which has been on our radar, and we do have a management plan to address next year. Indian Lake had a really great, lake when it, a gr great year when it came to lake closures. There were no lake closures due to cyanobacteria. And in fact, if you were to look at the clarity of the lake over the course of the summer, it did fairly well compared to how it usually does. Indian Lake is typically a little bit murky, um, but if we look at the clarity and measure it by depth using a Secchi disc, which is a, um, a black and white disc that we lower into the water until it disappears, the further down it goes, the, uh, the better the Secchi depth. The Secchi depth usually at Indian Lake is around four or three. This year, it was closer to five and a half on average. So it did fairly well. And this is probably because of the lack of cyanobacteria, which makes the water murkier. We also had no beach closures due to fecal bacteria. So in addition to no cyanobacteria closures, we had no beach closures, no closures for any bacteria. And some of this could have to do with the beach fence, the, the goose fencing, but a lot of it probably had to do with the lack of rain. We know that rain is the major way that bacteria gets into the beaches, as well as all that phosphorus that's causing the cyanobacteria blooms. So things were going great at Indian Lake until about mid-August when I started getting some strange phone calls. People were reporting mounds on the lake floating mounds that were moving from one side to the other, sometimes big enough that a person could stand on top and float. What? <laughs> I get called out to Sears Island and um, am shown this image um, or this, this site from someone's backyard. You could see the geese are enjoying the mounds. They don't seem to be too bothered by them. We could we quickly determined that the mounds are not a public health issue. <laughs> so, so that's, we got that out of the way. Um, but what the heck is going on? 
Um, it turns out that the lack of rain was doing something else to Indian Lake. This is the water level at Indian Lake from February 2022 to February 2023. You could see at the beginning of the year, we had our drawdown. The water level came up as we filled the lake and had a spring high at the spillway of about 7.2 feet. As the drought began, water level dropped to a summer low of five feet, over two feet lower than the spring high. So what does this do to the lake? When you drop the water level, you begin to expose the sediments along the shore. Here, the plants had already started to grow underwater. Now they were drying out. Meanwhile, people were using the lake for recreation, creating waves from their boats, which were causing these dried out sediments to become dislodged. The dislodged dried sediments now float. They float through the lake until they ultimately reabsorb water and sink to the bottom really strange, kind of annoying for these residents at least when they, when they lodged into their house, ultimately not dangerous and ultimately not something we think is going to happen year after year, but is a really interesting example of how a lack of rain for all the good that it does for Indian Lake can also have some unexpected consequences. So lumps aside, mounds I think they're technically, Mounds aside, <laughs> the state of Indian Lake was good. We had, we had a good year, no closures for cyanobacteria or bacteria, and the management plan is working. We would love to see a little bit higher clarity, and that's something that we're hoping the alum dosing station will help us with. Downstream, we have Salisbury Pond. Salisbury Pond is located in Institute Park um, and gets a lot of its water from Indian Lake. It has walking paths around the perimeter, but limited direct access. It's been sampled just by the WCMC since 2021. And up to this point, it's been overseen by the Friends of Institute Park, which is a nonprofit group that has been really concerned about the depth of Salisbury Pond. There's a lot of sediments in Salisbury Pond, and it currently has an av um, a deepest point that is about three feet, with an average depth that is much less. And this is not great for the wildlife that lives here and the long-term implications. Another thing that the Friends of Institute Park were starting to notice was this, the water chestnut. This, this, uh, this photo is familiar. Um, within a few years, we went from one or two plants to what you see up here, basically a carpet of green. So we worked with the Friends of Institute Park to uh, get a, a permit for uh, a clear cast treatment, an invasive aquatic plant treatment that we could apply to the surface of this water chestnut. And so here's a little time lapse of what happened when we applied that. Um, it was fairly effective. Over six weeks, we saw that um, we were able to get rid of the water chestnut <laughs> for now. <laughs> Any of you familiar with water chestnut know that those nuts that it produce, they're still there. They'll come back next year, they'll come back the year after. This is an ongoing water uh, management plan, but we're getting there. The good news is the WCMC volunteers did not really find much in the way of cyanobacteria, which is surprising given how warm and shallow the, um, the water body is. They did find, and what we found when we were there, is that it was very shallow and the drought did not help this. So we don't have a state of a lake for Salisbury Pond, but we do have an initial assessment. Um, we know that there's invasive plants and we know that there's a sediment issue, but we do need more monitoring and an integrated management plan to really mo move forward um, to where we wanna see Salisbury Pond in the future. The same goes for Little Indian Lake and Kiver Pond. These are small, shallow ponds that are hydrologically connected to, little, to, to Big Indian Lake. Kiver Pond is privately owned and Little Indian Lake has um, limited public access across uh, Grove Street. Both have been monitored by the WCMC since 2017 by a group of really dedicated volunteers. And Little Indian Lake has been managed in part by the, Lake Quincy, uh, by the Indian Lake Watershed Association um, for about 10 years now, mostly for invasive aquatic plants. This year, that management um, addressed what's called um, 
duckweed. <laughs> so duckweed is a really interesting little plant because it's a very small fl flower that looks a lot like cyanobacteria from far away. Um, so it's often confused with cyanobacteria but can reproduce quickly and cause a problem. Little Indian Lake was treated for that, but what it really probably should have been looking uh, at more than that, the, the management company, was cyanobacteria. So our WCMC volunteers use a variety of different um, parameters where they want to measure um, cyanobacteria. The most important one is called pigment, phycocyanin pigment. And this is a direct indicator of how much cyanobacteria is in a waterway. We use 50 RFUs um, as kind of the reference point to know if there is a challenge with cyanobacteria in a waterway. And if we map that 50 RFU line on our graphs for cyanobacteria, we see that Little Indian Lake and Kiver Pond spent a lot of time above that line with their results. And so our initial assessment is that both Little Indian Lake and Kiver Pond are threatened for cyanobacteria and that more monitoring and maybe a more targeted uh, management plan are needed there. So here at Millbrook, um, we have our, state, our lake assessments. We have a state of the lake for Indian Lake, and Indian Lake had a really, really good year, in part because of the rain. And our initial assessments at Salisbury Pond, Little Indian Lake, and Kiver Pond um, are that Kiver and Little Indian are challenged by cyanobacteria, and Salisbury Pond has invasive plants and sediments. So now we're going over to the uh, eastern side of Worcester. And so Lake Quinsigamon watershed, um, which is probably one of the bigger watersheds in Worcester, um, and that we share with the town of Shrewsbury. So um, here, excuse me one second. So the Lake Quinsigamon watershed um, contains ponds in it because it, we share it with Shrewsbury that aren't all in Worcester. So we have Newton Pond and Jordan Pond, um, which are located in Shrewsbury, as well as Flint Pond to the south, um, south of Route 20, which is just below Lake Quinsigamond. So both Newton Pond and Jordan Pond feed into Lake Quinsigamond, and they're quite small in relation. They're both outside of Worcester. Um, they're monitored for fecal bacteria by the town of Shrewsbury, as well as by the WCMC for cyanobacteria. Newton Pond is being taken under management by the Lake Quinsigamond Commission um, for invasive aquatic plants, but to date has not had any management done there. So we got great news back from our volunteers with the WCMC showing that cyanobacteria were not a concern in these two locations, which is great news. All the results coming back well below the 50 uh, RFU line. One thing we did learn, however, was that there were periodically issues with fecal bacteria. In weekly testing throughout the summer by the town of Shrewsbury, um, Newton Pond failed two of the 14 tests, and Jordan Pond failed four. What's interesting is that these were different weeks of testing. Additionally, invasive plants were reported at Newton Pond, um, and so when we look at our initial assessment for Newton and Jordan Pond, we see that there were threats for fecal bacteria and invasive plants at Newton, and more monitoring and um, and management is needed in both of the, more monitoring is needed to determine the other challenges that we're facing there. So now we come to Lake Quinsigamond, which is the largest lake in the city and which actually straddles um, Shrewsbury as well. So Lake Quinsigamond offers enormous recreational value. You could row, you can sail, you can jet ski, you could water ski, um, and therefore has been monitored for some time by the Lakes and Ponds program, as well as the WCMC and the Lake Quinsigamond Watershed Association. It's currently managed for invasive aquatic plants by the Lake Quinsigamond Commission um, and, and has been for some time. Some of the threats that we know about at Lake Quinsigamond include fecal bacteria related beach closures. So there are two state beaches, Regatta Point and Lake Park, and they have historically had some challenges with closures during the summer. We know that there are various invasive and nuisance aquatic plants that are starting to hinder recreation, 
and that there are low levels of dissolved oxygen in the bottom of the lake, which could be a problem since Lake Quinsigamon um, is home to some um, cold water fish species like trout. And finally, we know that sometimes it experiences false cyanobacteria blooms like this one, which was posted um, by a resident on the Facebook page. But as you are probably already aware, there are other events at Lake Quinsigamon in 2022 that were cause for concern. And I'm gonna talk about both of them briefly here. The first one has to do with construction that occurred off of Belmont Street beginning in 2020. In this particular location, there were multiple large sites opened up by various contractors at the same time. Unfortunately, the soils in this part of the city are really silty and during intense rain events, um, the erosion controls at these sites were not sufficient to hold back silty runoff. This resulted in sediment rich rainwater entering the drainage system and ultimately getting into Lake Quinsigamon through this Route 9 outfall, the one under the Burns Bridge shown in this picture. Unfortunately, between October 2020 and April of 2022, there were at least six of these events until the sites were permanently stabilized. And this is what it looked like from a residence window over Lake Quinsigamon. And while the multiple open sites um, off of Belmont Street made it really difficult to determine who was responsible for this, um, we know that Conservation Commission, DEP, and EPA were involved in, this, uh, in these incidents. And Lakes and Ponds was able to get out there and sample during one of these events in early 2020. Another unfortunate event that took place at Lake Quinsigamon in 2022 was the Lake Ave pump station sewer overflow back one February ago. While detailed reports of uh, this incident and subsequent action can be found in detail on the City of Worcester website, in short, the event was a catastrophic failure of a pump in the sewer pump station on Lake Ave North which resulted in 5.75 million gallons of untreated sewage being released into Lake Quinsigamon over 36 hours. This of course resulted in the immediate closure of the lake to recreation and subsequent sampling by the Lakes and Ponds program in order to determine public safety as well as short term ecological effects. Ultimately, the lake was open 18 days later. So first we're gonna talk about the immediate short-term effects of each of these and the findings throughout the season. So when we got out to the lake following the sedimentation event from Belmont Street erosion control failure, the lake was pretty low clarity. That chocolate milk that you saw at the outfall, yes, that was there for a little while. We also found very high concentrations of phosphorus, that nutrient we know causes cyanobacteria blooms um, and nuisance plant growth. And while the water clarity resumed shortly after the rain stopped, we saw evidence of that silty sediment on the bottom of the shallow areas of Lake Quinsigamond. We have reason to believe that these results would have been similar to the other at least five events that occurred. The sampling that occurred immediately after the pump station event found, with very little surprise, that there was elevated fecal bacteria immediately around the pump station. However, there was very little in the open water. This is thought to be because fecal bacteria don't live for very long outside of a warm-blooded animal, and it was really cold in February. We also found that there were elevated levels of phosphorus immediately around the pump station. Um, and around much of the shore, probably, um, though there was not as much of it offshore, because like with the um, bacteria, there might have been a little bit of dilution occurring as well. We also didn't find any contaminants of concern, such as heavy metals or VOCs. Over the next few weeks, we didn't see any indicators of effects on biological activity. The oxygen levels in the water stayed pretty high, and there were no signs of fish kills. So again, if you want to see the full report on what we found, the results from our sampling, that is available on the Lakes and Ponds webpage. Um, 
sorry, I just want to make sure I get this to you. Uh, but in short term, it appeared that the effects of the, on the lake were minimal, mostly probably because of how cold it was. I think we could both we could all agree that both of these events were unacceptable and they should never happen again. But the truth of the matter is, if these happen in the summer instead of the winter, it would be a whole different story. So what happens then when the lake starts to warm up? As our short-term monitoring plan ended, we started shifting into our longer-term annual monitoring activities. So the beginning of the sampling season was very much a typical summer for Lake Quinsigamond. There was a little oxygen stress, but not enough to harm our fish species. Um, there were some closures due to bacteria, but actually Lake Park had no closures all summer, and bacteria levels in the middle of the lake weren't high at all. Um, there were no special contaminants of concern to be found. We measured PFAS, we didn't see high levels of PFAS. But as we move to the end of the summer into the fall, um, which is when we began, that's when we start, started to see the lake turnover. This is something that happens to really deep lakes where they become thermally stratified. And as it gets cooler, they're allowed to begin mixing again. So as this happened, we started to see some strange but not altogether unexpected things. We started to receive complaints of invasive plants near Route 9. This is a photo taken from the Burns Bridge looking down with Worcester on the right and Ramshorn Island on the left. And you can see it's pretty murky. There's a lot of plants. We also saw earlier than expected cyanobacteria blooms. Usually we will see cyanobacteria blooms occur on Lake Quinsigamond, but they'll happen in November and December time when those nutrients are mixing up into the water column. This was the earliest that we have recorded um, getting um, reports of cyanobacteria blooms from the public. So what is going on? So one of the things that we measure at the Lakes and Ponds program is phosphorus. So typically, on Lake Quinsigamond, phosphorus concentrations at the surface are pretty low. We don't usually see cyanobacteria blooms during the beginning of the summer. All these orange dots, those are cyanobacteria concentrations at the surface, mostly below the detection limit of the laboratory. But throughout the summer, we start to see that the results at the bottom begin to creep up. And this has to do in part with that thermal stratification that doesn't allow the cycling of these nutrients up to the surface. What we found was that in the southern site, the one um, that has been most affected by these disturbances, we started seeing higher levels of phosphorus on the bottom of Lake Quinsigamon than we've ever recorded. This pattern, it happens every year. It happened this year more extreme than we've ever seen it. Take that and compare it to the northern site, about a mile and a half upstream near the rowing club. There, we also saw this pattern, but the difference in the amount of phosphorus is huge. Here we have 0.14 milligrams per liter. Up here we have 0.4 milligrams per liter. So what's the significance of that? It's on the bottom of the lake. But that means that when the lake starts turning over and the lake starts mixing again, that this phosphorus becomes available. When we saw those cyanobacteria blooms, they were primarily in the southern portion of the lake. We also got back the results from our evasive aquatic map, mapping uh, study. So we had someone go out for a whole week across the entire lake collecting samples of invasive plants and they mapped this. We were able to get a better idea of the different plants that were in the lake, both the invasive and the native ones, and where they were the most dense. We found that there are actually 15 native species of plants in Lake Quinsigamon, which is really great, really biodiverse. But unfortunately, we also have six invasive species. We ha saw this year that we had increased infestations of fanwort, Eurasian milfoil, and we found water chestnut. Ugh. Um, these were in clusters um, north of 290. Down here in Flint Pond, Round Pond, 
Half Moon Cove, and would you believe it, right below Route 9. Unfortunately, neither the cyanobacteria nor the increased number of invasive aquatic plants could be attached to one of those events I mentioned earlier. In addition to there being so much happening in the lake, we also had that really crazy year with the lack of rain and the really warm water. We can both agree, sorry, we could all agree <laughs> that both of these events have had detrimental effects to our lake, but unfortunately we cannot point our finger at any one cause for this. What we can do is we can make a plan to fix things. And when it comes to invasive aquatic plants, we're doing just that. And so despite all of this, despite the phosphorus and despite the invasive plants, we have to remember that Lake Quinsigamond for most of the summer actually had a really good year. We had fairly good temperatures, the oxygen stress was not too bad, and we didn't have too many high bacteria numbers. And so Indian Lake does consider to have a good state, but we do really need to keep an eye on these dynamics and see if this is a one-off or if this is something that is continuing, as well as continue to manage those invasive aquatic plants. Finally, in the Lake Quinsigamon watershed, we have Flint Pond, which is new to our program. It's shallow and it's right south of Lake Quinsigamon, so it, all the water that passes through Lake Quinsigamon goes into Flint Pond. Um, it was part of the WCMC this year for the first time, and what we found was that there were a lot of cyanobacteria in the fall portion of the year. This is a photo of a bloom that occurred um, on October 15th. So we don't really have too much to compare this to, this being the first time that Flint Pond is in the program. It was also a hot year, um, but we also know that from anecdotal reports from other volunteers that this does happen fairly frequently in Flint Pond. And so definitely something we want to continue to keep an eye on. Um, for now, what we know in our initial assessment of Flint Pond is that we have cyanobacteria. Um, there were four bacteria advisories in 14 weeks. Um, at the boat ramp on Flint Pond, and we do have invasive aquatic plants. And so more monitoring and a management plan is needed at Flint Pond. So here at Lake Quinsigamond, the state of the lake is good. Um, our initial assessments are that we have um, fecal bacteria challenges at all three of Newton, Jordan, and Flint Pond. We also have um, challenges with invasive aquatic plants at Newton Pond and Flint Pond as well as cyanobacteria at Flint Pond. All right, well then we're gonna move on to uh, Tatnik Brook Watershed, um, which we are really excited to share with you tonight. Um, so Tatnik Brook Watershed is located in the western portion of Worcester. So this is a really fascinating watershed um, because of how it is situated um, going from Holden through Worcester. So Tatnik Brook flows from north to south, starting up here in Holden and coming down through Worcester. It starts in Holden, um, where it's kind of a rural suburban area with a lot less of those roads and roofs um, that we had been talking about earlier in the presentation. And as Tatnik Brook goes down into Worcester, it becomes more developed and um, we have an increasing urbanization gradient. Previously, we've only been able to sample here at Coes Reservoir, almost at the end of Tatnik Brook. This year, thanks to our partnerships, we are really excited to share that we have been able to also sample at Patch Pond, which is immediately upstream. We also have Patch Reservoir, um, as well as Cook's Pond. And so by sampling all of these ponds in a row with the help of Worcester State, we could begin to see what the effects of this urbanization has on water quality. So we're gonna start at the bottom and work our way up. So Coes Reservoir is the largest impoundment of Tatnik Brook. It has a public beach and a boardwalk. Um, and has seen other great investments over the past few years, including a new bathhouse, an accessible playground, 
and of course that beautiful boardwalk. So the pond has been sampled and managed by the Lakes and Ponds program since 2017, and it suffers from sediment coming in from private roads, as well as invasive aquatic plants. Cyanobacteria blooms, though usually more toward the fall. We don't see them as much in the summer here, um, as well as fecal bacteria closures at the beaches. The management that we've used at Coes Reservoir, this is probably the place we've been most successful in using the goose fencing. Um, we, uh, in addition to um, using um, herbicide treatments on the water chestnut challenges we have there, we have had some community organized water chestnut pulls. We've also installed an invasive uh, plant boat decontamination station to try and prevent more of these plants from getting into the lake. And we've also had a cyanobacteria management plan there, though usually, honestly, we're more looking toward the fall when we see the blooms occurring in this area. But we do sample there and we do try to respond. So what are the results at Coes Reservoir this past year? Coes Reservoir had a really great year when it came to um, beach closures. Much like at Indian Lake, and Lake Park, we saw no beach closures related to E. coli. We also saw increased control of our invasive aquatic plant management plan. We were able to push back that infestation further back into the north, um, which is really the result of many years of treatment of that really recalcitrant uh, challenge of, of um, water chestnut. But in addition to um, not having as many beach closures, the lack of rain in Coes Reservoir also caused something else. We saw a lack of spilling at our outlet, the spillway. This is the dam looking downstream from that bridge that many of you are familiar with. In July, we had a trickle over the dam. August, there was no spilling at all. And as a result, all of the water inside of the, of the reservoir wasn't leaving, and it was just warming up. We had our first ever summertime cyanobacteria closure when some lifeguards noticed some scums along the edge of the water body. We had not sampled yet, but we closed the water body out of abundance of caution and got some sampling in as soon as possible. And it's a good thing we did. When we are measuring cyanobacteria at a beach for a public health advisory, we're looking at the number of cells that are in the water. If the number of cells get to a certain concentration, in this case 70,000, that's when they're able to produce toxins in numbers that are high enough to hurt humans and pets. During this period at uh, Coes Reservoir, we saw that the cyanobacteria concentration there was above this threshold. So it was a really good thing that we closed. We did sample four toxins and we found that there were none, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have started producing in any moment. The real challenge now in this, in, in this, um, in this closure was that it was occurring during one of our first heat waves this past summer in July. And so the closure of Coes Reservoir to swimming was a huge blow to the community, um, not just around the reservoir, but really the entire city. And unfortunately, it, didn't, it happened again. We saw a fall time closure. This closure happened after the recreational season ended. Um, so we were no longer gonna be treating the reservoir, but shortly into September after Labor Day, we saw the levels of cyanobacteria go high and stay high for 73 days. We had an advisory at Coes Reservoir. So despite all the positive work going on at the reservoir, Coes Reservoir um, receives a rating of fair this year, which is actually the first time it's ever received a rating of fair. Usually it's good. Um, and a lot of this probably has to do with the heat. Um, but that cyanobacteria closure for so long in the summer was such a blow to the community 
that it's very obvious that um, the health of the waterway is impacting its use for us. Going upstream to Patch Pond, um, that's the next in the chain of impoundments going up Tatnik Brook. This is one of the smallest. Um, there's little public access to this waterway and little is known, but it was sampled by the WCMC in 2022. In fact, it was sampled by our intern, Emily. Um, so cyanobacteria here were a concern um, in the later months. We saw cyanobacteria activity there around the same time that we saw it at Coe's Reservoir. But unfortunately, this is the only activity or the only monitoring that we've done at Patch Pond. So there's not too much we can say besides that we need to keep an eye on it for cyanobacteria. So Patch Reservoir is the next largest water body after Coe's in the Tatnik Brook chain. There's no beach, but there is public access through the Conservation Commission land. Um, the pond is managed by the Friends of Patch Reservoir, which is an amazing uh, watershed group that really came together after the water chestnut infestation a few years ago to address that. Um, and this year it was sampled by both the WCMC as well as Worcester State University. So in addition to the water chestnut that they've had there, they've had some other invasive plants. Um, there are also periodic really vibrant cyanobacteria blooms that occurred here. After Cook's Pond, we have Tatnik, uh, excuse me, after uh, Patch Reservoir, we have Cook's Pond, which is the last impoundment, or really the first impoundment in Worcester of Tatnik Brook, the closest to Holden. So Cook's Pond has public access through the Greater Worcester Land Trust and the Conservation Commission land on Olean Street. Um, it's been sampled by the WCMC since 2018, but also by Worcester State University in 2022. It's currently managed by the Smith Pond Corporation, um, and their major concern has been on invasive aquatic plants. So because these waterways were sampled by Worcester State using the Lakes and Ponds Program Sampling Plan, we are able to assign states of the lake to Patch Reservoir and Cook's Pond for the very first time. But because it wasn't the Lakes and Ponds program that did the sampling, I am going to be inviting up one of our students from Worcester State to share the results with you. So I'd like to invite Kari McCunis to come on up and um, share the results that um, they found at Cook's Pond and Patch uh, Reservoir. I should also note that Kari has contributed so much to the reports on both Cooks and Patch Pond that you are, can find um, by scanning the QR codes here. She's been an integral part of this whole process. So it's all yours, Kari. Thank you. So for Patch Reservoir in 2022, for the results, there was a cyanobacteria bloom in July, as you can see by the elevated number on the right of the screen. There are also high phosphorus and low water clarity within the reservoir, which you can also see now at the top right of the screen. There were also higher temperatures than we would have liked also in the reservoir, especially during the summer months, which you can see on the right of the screen. Because of these factors, um, oh, well, these factors, most likely the high temperatures, the high nutrients are what contributed to the big cyanobacteria bloom. And, but we also, on the bright side, had increased control of invasive plants. So for our management activities, we were able to treat the cyanobacteria in July, as well as the water chestnut. And we were able to spray the water chestnut this year in a way where it actually went away for the most part and we didn't have as much of a problem. But because there was a cyanobacteria bloom and there are invasives still present at Patch, Patch Reservoir receives a rating of fair. For Cook's Pond, um, it was almost the exact opposite. There were low cyanobacteria and fecal bacteria counts, as you can see on the right of the screen. It never even got near the red line. There was also low nutrient amounts, which you can kind of see nothing went above the fair. There are also healthy temperatures for the pond throughout the entire sampling season. There was also a low number of invasive species, which was good. Because of previous invasive aquatic plant treatments that were applied uh, several years ago, we could only 
had to hand pull the invasive aquatic plants. We didn't have to do any chemical treatments or any treatments for cyanobacteria blooms. So because of this, Cook's Pond receives a score of excellent for 2022. And I'm going to hand it back over to Jacqueline now. Thanks so much. Hi. And thanks so much to all of the students at Worcester State and the faculty that made this project possible. It's really, really expanded by the program so much over the past year. Um, and I'm really excited to see what comes next from this collaboration. So in short, in Tatnick Brook Watershed, we now have three states of the lake. Coes Reservoir received a fair, unfortunately, for the first time ever. Patch Reservoir received a fair, and Cook's Pond received an excellent. We also have um, an initial assessment for Patch, I'm sorry, Patch Pond for cyanobacteria. Um, so one of the other goals, as I mentioned, um, for this project was to really look at how water quality changed as we had that increasing urbanization gradient. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily have all the data prepared for you tonight. Um, my understanding is that Worcester State is looking to prepare a separate presentation in which we'll dig a little bit deeper into what the results are. But the teaser is that they've already found um, an increasing amount or some kind of gradient when it comes to conductivity going downstream. So conductivity is not a reading that we do here with the Lakes and Ponds program, um, but really is measuring, um, looking at kind of the amount of salt that is in a water body. All right, so we're gonna go into our last grouping, um, our parks ponds. So the final grouping of ponds that I have for you tonight are quick. Um, they're kind of hydrological misfits of sorts. Um, they might be located outside of the stormwater system, or maybe they're so far from the other water bodies in their watershed that it doesn't make sense to relate them. Um, but because they're located in parks, um, they have a lot of public access, and therefore especially those public health implications are important for us. Um, so for our park ponds, we have Green Hill Park Ponds, which is probably the biggest. We have Elm Park Pond. We have Burncoat Pond. Leesville Pond, which isn't in this photo because it is so far away. Um, and then we have Bell Pond. So Green Hill Park Pond is a gem of Green Hill Park, which is the largest park in the city. While there's no swimming, there is occasionally boating. Um, and there has always been concerns about the effects that the golf course could have on the water body. Um, so the, the WCMC has been monitoring the lake since 2021, but it is not currently managed. Um, and WCMC volunteers have found that there was really no threat of cyanobacteria over the course of 2022, which is really great news. Um, however, there's still a lot that we don't know, like um, if this was an off year for the lake cyanobacteria or not, but as of right now, um, the Lakes and Ponds program has not identified any threats at Green Hill Park Pond, but more monitoring is definitely needed. So Elm Park Pond is a small pond, but is in one of Worcester's most historic parks. What's interesting about this water body is that it has no connections to the stormwater system. To maintain the water level in, Green, in uh, Elm Park Pond, we had to drill a well. <laughs> we drilled down a well 70 feet to pump up water from an aquifer below the park. Unfortunately, this aquifer sometimes dries up, and it's usually drying up in the middle of a drought, which is exactly when the lake is at its lowest. So this has its challenges because um, Elm Park Pond is beginning to have um, some sedimentation issues. There are some invasive plants growing up, especially underneath the bridges that connect the various nodes of the pond. And this is hindering some of the recreational activities that happen here, such as ice skating in the winter, but it's also not great for any of the ecosystems that depend on the pond. So there's currently no management plant here at Elm Park Pond. Um, the WCMC found that in this very shallow, warm pond, there were very high concentrations of cyanobacteria, well above that red line of 50 RFUs. In addition to this, it was confirmed that there were invasive plants overgrowing um, in the portions of the pond that was exposed during the drought, um, and that sedimentation was an issue. 
So the initial assessment at Elm Park Pond is that there are cyanobacteria, there's sedimentation challenges and invasive aquatic plants and a management plan is very much needed here. Burncoat Pond is a small pond off of Millbrook Street in Burncoat Park. It's heavily used by anglers and it has a lot of pedestrian access. It's not currently managed, but it has been sampled by a very dedicated group of WCMC volunteers since 2019. In 2022, vo volunteers found that Burncoat Pond was dominated by cyanobacteria for the entire season, which confirms a year after year pattern that we have seen here, that blue-green algae, those cyanobacteria, are really the only thing that live in this lake. In fact, a plant survey in 2019 found that there were no aquatic plants to be found. It was just a soup of cyanobacteria. And so the initial assessment here at Burnco Pond is that um, the pond is threatened severely by cyanobacteria and that more monitoring and management are needed. Um, in contrast to this, we have Leesville Ponds um, in the southern portion of Worcester crossing into Auburn through All Faith Cemetery. In 2022, we had WCMC volunteers vol uh, sample here for the very first time, and we really had no idea what we were going to find. We had never done any sampling. I don't think I spent much time in that cemetery at all. Um, but we are very pleased to report that there were no reports of cyanobacteria, very low levels at most. Um, and currently we have not identified any um, initial threats at this water body. But of course, we've only been looking for cyanobacteria. And finally, we come to Bell Ponds. Bell Pond, which is a small pond off of Belmont Street, used to be drinking and fire suppression water for the city of Worcester. With no storm water inputs, it gets all of its water from underground springs. So it's all filtered naturally. It has a public beach and trails and it's been part of the Lakes and Ponds program sampling since 2017. Um, for the most part, water quality at Bell Pond has always been very good, um, but we have had an invasive mollusk, the uh, uh, Corbicula fluminea, um, which um, we, all, we have found shells of, never live species, but a lot of shells, um, and sometimes large amounts of litter. So in 2022, water quality continued to be very high. There were no beach closures due to bacteria and water clarity was the highest in the city. Only dipping below 10 feet of clarity on um, two occasions in the middle of the summer. But for the most part at Belpon, you could see the bottom anywhere in the lake. There was no sign of cyanobacteria activity high levels of oxygen and a plant survey did alert us to some phragmites um, that common reed so we did find that there were some invasives along the shoreline but nothing that we won't be able to manage in 2023. the management activities that we did perform at bell pond were actually outreach and education um, a few years ago we had gotten some footage um, underwater camera footage of all the trash on the bottom of bell pond that had collected there over the years and we were able to compile a blue space minute on the harm that litter does to our lakes and ponds. And we're hoping that this will educate people about the resource that Bell Pond is and hopefully help make them a little bit more conscientious about their habits. So as usual, the state of the lake at Bell Pond continues to be excellent. So overall, um, our park ponds have some good news. Bell Pond is a score of excellent and both Green Hill Park Pond and Leesville Pond have no identified threats. Um, we do see that there are some challenges with cyanobacteria at Elm Park Pond, as well as Burnco Pond, as well as sedimentation and invasive plants at Elm Park Pond. So here we have our water bodies and the states of our lakes. The initial assessments, um, excuse me one second. So here we have it all laid out, the states of our lakes, as well as our initial assessments. Most of our lakes are not excellent, and we've identified a lot of challenges. And keep in mind, we still have a lot more monitoring to do. And while we've made so much progress already with our monitoring and with our management, there's clearly a lot of work to be done. But doing enough monitoring and creating enough management plans for all of these lakes 
that's a lot. <laughs> Traditionally, we've been managing these water bodies like this, one lake at a time. And for better, for worse, um, we've seen that they're all interconnected. So maybe we can be a little bit more strategic about our investments by shifting from a lake management plan to a watershed management plan and make those investments more impactful on a bigger scale. So shifting from a lake management approach to a watershed-based management approach is not something that we made up here at the Lakes and Ponds Program. In fact, lakes and ponds programs are recommended by EPA and the Department of Environmental Protection. In fact, DEP is willing to fund or help fund your projects if you have a watershed-based plan that meets for certain <laughs> requirements. <laughs> And these are really familiar requirements. The plan needs to identify sources of pollution and create reduction goals, design projects to make reductions, identify potential grants to help you get from point A to point B, create a timeline of milestones, and develop criteria so that you can go back and monitor your progress along the way. Obviously, we're already in a really great position to make this shift. And by doing so, by creating a watershed-based plan for Tatnick Brook, Mill Brook, and Lake Quinsigamon, we can do more than just manage and monitor Coes Reservoir, Indian Lake, and Lake Quinsigamon. We could manage and monitor all the lakes in that watershed. We could continue to bring all of these water bodies up to higher states of the lake. This in, and we could do this with just three plans as opposed to 17. This is the future of the Lakes and Ponds program if we want to continue to grow. But if we wanna get from point A to point B, it won't be easy. We will need help, we will need to hire a contractor to help us make these plans, and we will need more staff to help us oversee it. Thankfully, we've already um, had some money put aside through ARPA to begin on this journey. And so we are on our way to this destination of making watershed-based plans. It might just take a little bit of time. But in the meantime, we're moving forward. For 2022, we already have some great programs in response to what you've seen tonight. We're going to be installing an additional cyanobacteria monitoring buoy at Lake or at Coes Reservoir to help give us early warning of if cyanobacteria populations are getting too high and hopefully allow us to treat in the beginning of the season um, if there is a threat to recreational use. We also want to begin to better understand the scums that are being seen earlier in the season on Lake Quinsigamon. Unfortunately, due to its large size, it's very difficult for the Lakes and Ponds program to go out and investigate every report of a scum, but that doesn't mean that they're not important in understanding lake dynamics. We've created a Google form in which residents on Lake Quinsigamon will be able to send in photos and locations and the dates where they've seen scums. If necessary, the Lakes and Ponds program could go out and investigate them, but then begin to react, putting out educational material, telling people how and how not to interact with them, and really understanding how things are changing over time. In addition, we're going to be doing a lot of monitoring at the alum dosing station as it gets up and running. We're going to be looking at phosphorus concentrations before the, the application of alum. We're going to look at phosphorus concentrations after. We're going to watch cyanobacteria at Indian Lake. And we're going to calibrate the system to make sure that we're able to reduce the closures at Indian Lake due to cyanobacteria and increase the, increase the clarity of the lake as much as possible. And finally, we're going to be doing a goose census. We are going to model population dynamics of the goose population here in Worcester. We know that the population is increasing. We already know that it's causing a public health issue. How can we um, understand how this population is changing over time and what are the humane options that we have to protect our blue spaces? We're looking forward to continuing to work with our partners at the universities. We hope to continue collaborating with Worcester State University on collecting data going up Tatnick Brook. 
We look forward to a collaboration with Clark University to study picocyanobacteria, those cyanobacteria that we're not able to see with our current microscopes, but which are existing at places like Elm Park Pond. We're looking forward to continuing to work with students at WPI. These students have helped us in the past to create educational programming using WCMC protocols and bringing them to a younger audience, such as middle schoolers and scout troops. And finally, we're in initial conversations on how we can share data with Holy Cross to research microplastics in our waterways. When it comes to management, we want to use the map that we were able to contract to help spearhead the development of a longer term sustainable management plan for invasive aquatic plants and address some of those issues at Lake Quinsigamon. We um, want to get in touch with Shrewsbury, with Grafton, and with the Lake Quinsigamon Commission in order to develop that longer term plan. We want to continue to improve our goose fencing and it, apply them to more locations throughout the city, um, hopefully working with DCR to be able to install them at Lake Quinsigamon as well. We are going to do a pilot project at Burncoat Pond um, to try and implement low cost solutions to cyanobacteria there, as well as an Elm Park Pond sediment removal project. And these last two I'm gonna go into just slightly more detail on because of how cool they are. <laughs> So the WCMC is an organization that aims to use ordinary people to use low cost methods to understand risk to cyanobacteria at their waterways. It is a monitoring program. We are going to move into the realm of creating low cost solutions for cyanobacteria. And so in 2023, we are hoping to do a pilot management project at Burncoat Pond, a place that is suffering from a lot of cyanobacteria activity. What we have seen in other projects is that the decomposition of barley straw in water releases hydrogen peroxide. And this hydrogen peroxide can target cyanobacteria specifically without harming other microorganisms in the water. In a collaboration with a project, or in a project that was done out in East Hampton, they were able to stuff barley straw inside of uh, onion bags and float them on stakes in their ponds in water bodies that had historically been plagued by cyanobacteria with really reassuring results. We're looking forward to, to trying out these methods at the Burncoat Pond with the WCMC. We're gonna be looking for volunteers to do this. So if you're interested in trying something out, we invite you to join the WCMC with us this year. At Elm Park Pond, um, we are going to be collaborating with the Parks Department to address some of those sediment issues in the bottom of the lake. We've already gotten permitting in place to remove a lot of the excess sediment and in invasive aquatic plants, and we're looking to expand that project. This is all part of a much bigger management plan to deepen the lake, allow for the water to be cooler, hopefully get some of those cyanobacteria issues in check and open it up for recreation and um, creating a healthier ecosystem for the surrounding wildlife. When it comes to outreach and education, we already have some really exciting projects in, sh in store for you. Historically, we've had some really great success partnering with Mass Wildlife for our angler education uh, series. This year, um, what, what a lot of people don't know about mass wildlife in Worcester is that they actually stock uh, trout in a, that are from fisheries or from hatcheries into our high quality waters, such as Bell Pond. One thing that we've done in the past are these angler education events. What we want to do next is teach people how to prepare those fish, identify trout, and then how do you prepare it? How do you cook it? At our first inaugural catch and cook event, residents from the Bell Hill area will be able to come, learn how to catch a fish, and then how to prepare and eat it. We're really looking forward to being able to um, engage a lot of the local residents in this one. Another project we're really excited about doing again is collaborating with the Tatnick Brook Watershed Association um, for an event that was originally held in 2021. Um, the Discovering Our Water Bodies Aquatic Science Day. At this event, we invited a lot of kids from the neighborhood to come and learn about how they could become an aquatic scientist, playing or using, implementing some of the tools that scientists use to measure water quality, 
catching fish, identifying fish, identifying macroinvertebrates, using microscopes. We had a blast and we can't wait to invite even more kids from the neighborhood to get involved this year. This year we're also releasing um, a system of text message lake alerts. So this is a system much like the Worcester um, 311 text message alert system um, that you opt into. And the idea is that we're gonna increase accessibility to our waterways so that when you are getting into your car to take your kids to the beach, you will already know if that beach is open before you get there. You will receive a text message if there's a, late, if there's a beach closure due to, cyanobact or to uh, fecal bacteria. If there's a late closure because of an invasive plant treatment, you will know ahead of time. And then you will know when that water body is opened again. Finally, the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative will be um, starting up again this year and we will be looking for new volunteers. We will be holding our information and training session on April 12th. And so there are a lot of opportunities to get involved if you've been inspired by anything that you've seen tonight. We are always looking to continue to collaborate with you, the residents, the university folks. Um, we really can't do it without you. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how you could get involved, I invite you to subscribe to our brand new newsletter, The Blue Space Splash. And you could actually sign up right now by scanning this code or the one that is on one of your sheets. In doing so, you'll receive just a monthly newsletter um, talking about our updates, volunteer opportunities, and events that we have coming up. To become a WCMC member and um, help collect data um, to, or even implement these cyanobacteria solutions, um, you can join us for our annual virtual training event. Um, you can sign up um, online following this QR code. You could sign up for our text message alert system um, by following this QR code so you'll never have to arrive to the beach and find it closed again. Finally, um, or next I should say, um, if you're interested in reporting something that you've seen on Lake Quinsigamon, um, such as a, a scum, and you're not sure what it is, you can take a picture of it and send it in using this Google form and we will track it for you. And then, if really all you wanted was a rain barrel, that's a huge help too. You could order a rain barrel by scanning this code. Um, they will arrive at some date in June um, for a bulk pickup. Perha but perhaps the things you wanna do are a little more specific. Perhaps there's a water body that's near and dear to your heart. I invite you to join your local watershed association. These folks are passionate about their waterways, but also the neighborhoods around them, and they're always looking for volunteers to help them move their projects forward. I also, if you're looking to enact change on a larger level, I invite you to check out the boards and commissions on our city website. There are so many things that local residents can do on a border commission to help improve the quality of lives um, for our residents as well as um, for our lakes. And there are currently vacancies on several of those boards. I invite you to talk to your elected officials. These folks here, um, some of them are here tonight, they are paid to listen to you. So tell them anything you want. And if you don't know who your elected official is, you can scan this QR code and figure it out and also get their contact information. Finally, I invite all of you to vote in your local and state elections. Most of the change that happens in Worcester happens in the local and state elections. Perhaps this um, is something that you don't know that much about. There are resources out there. Vote 411 is a place that you can go learn about ballot questions, learn about the platforms of your candidates, and create a voting plan so that you could get out and get your voice heard. Here in Worcester, there are elections that are decided by 10 votes. So your vote does count. So with that, I would like to thank all of you who did come out tonight, as well as all of you who are watching from home. Thank you so much for how much you care about your water bodies, for all the work that you've put in this year. Special thanks to our university partners, our watershed associations, our WCMC volunteers, 
and all of you folks um, for helping to keep our blue spaces beautiful. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great night.